Welcome to our services right here at Taylor's Valley Baptist Church. We're so glad you've chosen to join us this morning, and we have an amazing Sunday in worship ahead. But before we get started, I got a couple of really awesome things to let you know about. Armor Up, our student prayer partner program, is kicking off really, really soon. On August the 18th, at 12.30, right after church, we're going to have an interest meeting for anyone who's interested. So if you are interested in joining and being a prayer warrior for some of our young adults and our students, we would love for you to be there. You're going to hear way more about that in the coming weeks. Backpack Buddies is almost finished. We have an opportunity to really bless a lot of the kids in the area with some much-needed school supplies. So Donations are due back by the 4th of August. Make sure that you get those in so we can get all of those backpacks out on time. Finally, Blue Christmas is wrapping up soon. So if you grabbed one of those blue pinwheels, make sure you bring those items back so we can start putting those together and get those out to the foster families so that way we can bless those people and those kids. If you still would like to grab one of the pinwheels, please grab that today. Bring it back soon so we can get everything out on time. Everybody, it is so amazing that you've chosen to join us this morning. We hope you feel at home. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Taylor's Valley Baptist Church. I want to thank you for being here today and worshiping with us. If you are one of our guests, we greet you in the Lord. We'd love for you to fill out the connection card in the pew rack in front of you. And right after the service, those back doors to your right is our welcome center. And we've got a gift we'd love to share with you and be able to pray with you today. We pray for all of our guests every single week. I want to open today with Psalm 96. Psalm 96 verse 1 says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of the nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns, the world is firmly established, it cannot be moved, he will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound and all that is in it, let the fields be jubilant and everything in them, let all the trees of the forest sing for joy, let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes and he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people's in his faithfulness. Let's pray. Gracious Father, I pray today we would sing a new song to the Lord, that we would enter your courts with praise and thanksgiving, that your Holy Spirit would move in our midst and draw us to Christ. Help us to behold the glory and the beauty and the majesty of our Savior, to reflect on the gospel that he died on the cross for our sins, that he rose from the dead, and he ascended to the right hand of God the Father where he reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords. We love you, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. Let's stand together. The Lord does reign. And we worship him this morning for his goodness and his grace. He's our lion and our lamb. No one can stop the Lord Almighty. Let's worship together. Coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break, as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow Him. 
Let's open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is a lion and our lamb. Let's raise a hallelujah this morning to him in our praise and worship this morning. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a
seated. grab your Bible and open it up to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Well, while you're turning there, I want to tell you about something that I had when I was younger. And you might have one of these right now. When I was younger, I loved to sleep with a teddy bear. And I had this, I actually still have it, this awesome teddy bear that my mom made for me. And it was extra special because it was made out of some of my granddad's old work clothes. And I loved my granddad. He was one of my favorite people in the entire world. So at night when I would fall asleep, it would bring me comfort. It would remind me that I was loved and I was cared for. And it helped me feel peace so I could go to sleep. Well, why did my mom do that for me? Why did my granddad give his clothes old work clothes? So for me, because they loved me, right? When we think about people that we love, there's certain things that we do just because we love them. And there are certain ways that we receive love back from them. So let's take a look at this passage in scripture that talks about some things that God does just because he loves us and how we show our love back to him. 
So let's take a look at Psalm 91, verse 14. It says, Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So this week, while we were at camp, we looked at this passage of scripture. And one of the things that I've been thinking about ever since that is all the ways that God shows his love for us. He, in, a, in this passage, lists several of them. He rescues us. He protects us. He answers us whenever we call to him. He's with us. He delivers us. He satisfies us. He gives us this beautiful life, and he shows us salvation. He shows us how to be right with him by loving Jesus. So when we think about those are all the things that God does, what does God ask of us in this passage? It's in the very first verse, verse 14. It says, because he loves me. That's what God asks of us. Your translation might say something, because he has set his love upon me, or because he has set his heart upon me. That picture is when we put God first in our lives, when we make a decision that says, I'm going to love and follow God, I'm going to love and follow Jesus, that is our part. That's what we do. We love God and we follow him. What does God do? All of the rest. These are just a few of the things that he does for us. Aren't we so grateful that we have such an amazing God? We're going to continue in worship and we're going to get a chance to sing to, about how awesome he is. We're even going to get to tell him thank you for Jesus. So let's pray and then we'll continue in worship. God, we love you so much. God, there's no way that we could ever come close to understanding all of the ways that you love and care for us. But God, there is something that we can do. God, we can love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. So God, today, as we continue in worship, God, help us to set our hearts and our minds on you. As we sing songs, help us to think about what we're singing as we sing them to you. As we open up your word, God, help us to study it. God, reveal yourself to us. Help us to understand what it says. And God, thank you that every time we come to you in prayer, God, you answer us. You hear us. That's such an amazing gift. We love you and we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's continue in our worship. Would you like to stand with us? So we thank the Lord for his blood and sacrifice for us. Let's continue our worship. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide. Left behind heaven's throne. To build it here inside There at the cross You paid the debt I owe Broke my chains, freed my soul For the first time I had hope Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied Thank you, Jesus it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. You took 
took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood. bless your name today. We thank you for the blood and the sacrifice you gave because you loved us. May we praise your name with grateful hearts this morning. Oh, praise the name of Jesus. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down. In Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all
You may be seated. Hey, Taylor's Valley. We're here in Milwaukee having a good time. We, we uh, came in good yesterday in Chicago. We had a prayer meeting last night with the Spanish on our way to clean up a street in the inner city and this afternoon a block party for the inner city. Thank you guys for sending us and praying for us. God bless you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, so we've got a team right now in Wisconsin. Always want to, if we can, bring out when we've got uh, teams out doing mission work, and they're in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I know that they have had six decisions so far for Jesus Christ. That's wonderful. I know we've had in recent weeks preteen camp, youth camp, kids camp. I know we've had some salvations from there as well. And so, so excited to see what God is doing, what he'll continue to do in the life of this church. In fact, I think we've got several of our kids uh, wearing, you might notice that some folks are wearing the same t-shirt. If you would, stand up. Is that preteen camp or kids camp? If y'all would, stand up. Show them that your beautiful attire. All right, wonderful. So thankful for them and what all they did this past week at camp. Join me, if you would, in Hebrews Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, as we talk about how Jesus is greater. Continue to talk about that. Hebrews 12, verse 18, if you would, please stand in honor of God's word. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, 
You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels, joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that we cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let's pray. Lord, help us to humble ourselves before your word this morning. Help us to conform to your teachings, to obey them, to apply them to our lives, to take your word and your warning today seriously to make whatever necessary changes we need to make in our lives so that we might live to the glory of Christ, that we might be who you created us to be and live out the purpose that you've called us to, to run the race marked out for us. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the word nostalgia uh, means something that is a sentimental longing or wistful affection for the past. And all of us, from time to time, we have... Uh, nostalgic feelings, what we uh, deal with nostalgia, where uh, we think about the good old days. Now, a lot of times we're just thinking about certain experiences, certain uh, memories that we have, and that's fine, but sometimes uh, when we talk about the good old days, we Photoshop really what was actually true in the past, and we don't really appreciate uh, advancement or progress or improvement. For example, how many of us want to go back to the good old days before electricity? <laughs> Probably not many of us uh, back to the good old days before air conditioning. How did they survive? You know, if we didn't have air conditioning, we'd probably not have that many folks here if we had church at all, maybe. We live totally different lives today. If we wanted to go back, we could go back to the days of riding horse and buggy. We could go back to the days of where you were responsible for growing, gathering, or hunting your own food. We could go back to the days before modern medicine, before anesthesia, before uh, some of the practices that have made life a little bit easier today. We could go back to not having access, for many of us, to education, to reading books, We'd be dependent upon one person who had a book to share that with us. We could go back to the days, politically speaking, where we had an absolute monarch and everything just kind of depended upon whatever he or she wanted to do. In truth, probably very few of us would actually want to go back to some of the things what we call the good old days uh, because I'm doubting anybody rode up here this morning on horse and buggy. You had the opportunity to do so, and by the way, I would recommend you not do that because that would uh, make a parking problem for us, uh, but among other things. But uh, So uh, we think about the good old days. We might want to go back to have some of those, relive some of those memories, but in truth, society has advanced. Society has made progress. Well, what Hebrews is trying to do is on a spiritual level, he's dealing with a group of people who want to go back kind of to Mount Sinai who want to go back to Judaism. They're, they're tempted to go back to an old way of life. And what he's wanting to do for them in a spiritual way is very much what I just did for you in a general sense, to show them what advancement, what improvement, what progress has made, what progress Christ has made in their lives. He's basically saying to them, you glamorize the past all you want to, but let's compare two mountains. Let's compare Mount Sinai with Mount Zion, And he begins to talk through the various experiences of those who come before Mount Sinai and those who come before Mount Zion. And, of course, he's doing this in a metaphorical sense to talk about the covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant, that we are now in a new reality. We've been working through Hebrews for a while now. We're starting to come down to next week. We'll start in the final chapter. But as we come to chapter 12, uh, we come to what we've said is the pinnacle 
But these verses we're looking at today is the absolute summit. It's the very highest part of all that Hebrews has been building up to and some of the major themes that he's dealt with. He strings them all together here. His main basic point is that we have a better covenant and a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We have a better covenant and a kingdom that cannot be shaken. This means we are in a new spiritual reality, this new covenant receiving this unshakable kingdom. And it has implications for how you live your daily life. It's not just abstract theology. It's not just something for us to grow in our doctrinal knowledge of God and Scripture. Uh, These truths have implications for how you think, how you speak, and how you live on a daily basis. You should live your life in light of these biblical truths that we're going to go over today. So today we're talking about four actions in light of the fact that we have a better covenant and an unshakable kingdom. Number one, obviously, embrace the better covenant. Receive the better covenant. Receive what Christ has done once and for all. Well, first, let's start at the foot of Mount Sinai and go all the way back to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, uh, we find a very interesting scene in the Bible. One of the, I want to talk about pinnacles in the Bible. Uh, Exodus chapter 20 is one of those places that is foundational to all of the Bible. It's the place where we get the Ten Commandments. And we love to talk about the Ten Commandments. We love uh, to uh, promote the Ten Commandments and all this sort of stuff. But I want you to notice what the initial reaction to receiving the Ten Commandments was. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, this is after God spoke the Ten Commandments directly to them. And now let's see what their response is. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet, And saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. But the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. I want you to note the difference that we've made since Genesis chapter 3 and just one book later, Exodus 20. In Genesis, in Eden, uh, God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And before sin, you would imagine that uh, Adam and Eve had fellowship with God. And that must have been the highlight of their day to walk in fellowship with God in the garden in the cool of the day, to be with the one who is life, light, and love, and to be in that relationship. I can't imagine many things better than that, than being in the relationship with God. I kind of joked about this this week on social media. My house was quiet this week because I had uh, several out going to, uh, to camps and dog sitting and stuff like that. And so I found myself on an extremely rare occasion for a few nights this week where I was all alone. And it was the weirdest feeling for me uh, as a father of four and normally a house is bustling with excitement to be there all alone. Those relationships bring us joy. Those relationships bring us satisfaction, fulfillment. But imagine being in relationship with God in Eden. Everything's perfect. Everything's in direct access to God. But what happens when they sin against God the first immediate impact of sin is shame. They hide themselves in shame. They hide themselves in fear of God. And so now God is walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they are hiding from God. You fast forward just one book over in Exodus 20, and this is in many ways the beginning of the priesthood because God is speaking directly to the people. We all say, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful If God just came today and spoke directly to us, wouldn't that just be so wonderful? Well, that happened a few times in Scripture, and when it happened, not always was it a pleasant experience for the people. Because you notice here, they were afraid. They said, God, you do not speak to us, Moses. You go speak to God on our behalf. You be our mediator. As we learn a little bit later on in Deuteronomy 9.19, it says, Moses said, I feared the anger and wrath of the Lord, for he was angry enough with you to destroy you. 
But again, the Lord listened to me. So even the mediator, even Moses was afraid. Why was everyone so afraid? Well, let's go a little bit further in uh, the Old Testament to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. So as you read through the first five books of the Bible called the law, the Pentateuch, you've got Exodus where the events are actually happening. And then Deuteronomy means kind of the, the word itself means a second retelling of the law. And as we go through Deuteronomy, some of the things that they've been through, he is retelling, sometimes with even different language and a different perspective. And so in Deuteronomy 5, we have a retelling of Exodus 20. In Deuteronomy 5, 23, it says, When you heard the voice out of the darkness, the mountain was ablaze with fire. All the leaders of your tribes and your elders came to me, and you said... The Lord our God has shown, up, shown us his glory and his majesty, and we heard his voice from the fire. Today we have seen that a person can live even if God speaks with them, but now why should we die? This great fire will consume us, and we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. For what mortal has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we have and survive. Go near and listen to all that the Lord our God says. Then tell us whatever the Lord our God tells you. We will listen and obey. So why did they want Moses to be their mediator? Why did they want this to happen? Because of the glory, the power, and the holiness of God. They were terrified by the splendor of God's holiness and his glory. We read earlier in Psalm 96, 9, Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And when we, read, when we read that, we're like, oh, yes, let's worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. But meditate, think about the very next words, trembling, tremble before him all the earth. We tremble in fear because of the splendor of God's holiness, because he's so pure, he's so holy, he's so good that our sin is exposed. We recognize our sinfulness, our guilt, our unworthiness to stand before the direct revelatory presence of God. So even someone like Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah the prophet, you think, well, if anybody can stand before God, it's got to be Isaiah the prophet. But in Isaiah 6, when he stood before the holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, he said, woe to me, I am ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and he needed to have his guilt removed. Well, if we go back to Hebrews, as terrifying as it was to stand before Mount Sinai, we are standing before an even greater mountain. He now describes Mount Zion. He moves from Mount Sinai to Mount Zion. It's very interesting. As you look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 21, all that's one sentence. You ever get excited about something and so you start uh, doing one run-on sentence after another because you're getting excited? I think that as we come to, Hebrew, to this part of Hebrews, he is excited because verses 18 through 21 is all one sentence in the original language and verses 22 through 24 is all one sentence in the original language. So I think he really is coming to that climactic moment, to that pinnacle of his letter where he's getting really excited about what God has done as he brings all the threads together. So now he begins to talk about Mount Zion. And he gives a description. And in that description, he rehearses a lot of the themes he's talked about throughout the book. The city of the living God, that is the heavenly Jerusalem. He talks about thousands of angels in joyful assembly. He talks about the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. He talks about God, the judge of all, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. That is that great cloud of witnesses that he's talked about. Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, who's also our high priest, and the sprinkled blood by which we are made whole and in right relationship with God. So he's painting this picture for them that this is the way things were on Mount Sinai and how terrifying and how dark that was and the people's response. And this is the mountain that you are approaching. You are approaching a new spiritual reality. It's not a physical mountain. It's a new spiritual reality. And now how are they to approach this mountain? Well, I think the answer is found in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 and following. How are we supposed to approach this mountain? Well, they approach with fear and with dread. How do we approach the throne of God? In chapter 4, verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven... 
Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with what? With confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So they may approach with dread and fear. We approach with confidence because of what Christ has done on our behalf. Number two, we are to heed God's warning. Heed God's warning. We enter into this new spiritual reality. We enter with the confidence of a child approaching a parent. But number two, we must heed God's warning. I want you to notice something. At this point, we might conclude that there's nothing to be afraid of, and that would be the wrong conclusion to draw from this. Because we approach a greater mountain, because we approach a greater blessing, therefore we have greater responsibility to respond to the light that we've been given. So people are always concerned about people around the world who don't have access to the gospel and what's going to become of them. And I would just say that the God, the just and right God of all the earth will do right, whatever that is. But what I can say is that we've been given the light You've heard the revelation of God. You've heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're responsible with what you do with the word of Christ. We've approached great, the great Mount Zion. And we are responsible for what we do with the revelation of God. So notice again back to Hebrews 12 with what it says in verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. Now, what happened to those in the Old Testament who heard the word of God and then they did not heed God's warning? Well, it says in verse 25, if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? How much better do you think it's going to be for us having heard from the voice in heaven compared to them? In short, he's saying we've arrived at a greater mountain, we have a better covenant, and therefore rejecting this greater mountain, this better covenant, will lead to greater judgment than perishing in the wilderness as they did. God is shaking the heavens. He's shaking the heavens and the earth once more, he says, and that will reveal once and for all what kingdom you are aligned with. So you can put on a show for all of us here at church. You can put on a show for me. You can put on the show for the people around you. But ultimately, one day, the intentions and the motivations and the thoughts of our hearts will be exposed. That's what it means by shaking everything. There's only one kingdom that is an unshakable kingdom. And it ain't your kingdom and it ain't my kingdom. And it's none of the kingdoms on this earth. The only kingdom that is unshakable is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he's talking about is that when he shakes everything... We're going to find out once and for all which kingdom you belong to. Because you'll either perish with that kingdom or you will stand in confidence in the kingdom of God. So this is a warning to us. Because God loves us, he warns us. And he warns us to wake us up to the reality of the direction of our lives. We have a tendency to fall into a slumber. We have a tendency to just kind of fall into a lull, into apathy or lukewarmness. And God warns us to wake us up to the reality of the sin in our lives so that we might turn from it. We might believe in God. And we might not reject the one who is life, light, and love. If you reject the one who is life, light, and love, then you get death, darkness, and destruction. We should heed God's warning. Number three. Live with a good news perspective. Live with a good news perspective. As we go all the way down to the end of chapter 12, it says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us first be thankful. Let us be thankful since Mount Zion is real and since Christ has died for our sins and rose from the dead, we should live our lives in that warm, brilliant light of truth, that we belong to an unshakable kingdom, that our soul is secure in Jesus Christ, that no weapon formed against us shall stand. His basic point is just simply that we belong to an unshakable kingdom, and we should therefore live with thanksgiving and gratitude in our hearts. Mount, Z excuse me, Mount Sinai brought dread and fear. We, we've gone over that. Um, at Mount Sinai, everyone is terrified, even the mediator. 
Okay, so this, you're, you're looking, and Moses, a lot of times you look to your leaders for confidence to give you a sense of calmness in the midst of something that's scary. But it says even Moses was terrified. I have a trick. Y'all know I don't like to fly, okay? And so, uh, but I do. And so it's a mind game the entire time I'm flying usually. <clears throat> and one of the, the tricks that I use is I look at the flight attendant and I watch their demeanor, okay? I look at the flight attendants and, and I figure if they're calm and confident, then I'm going to feel okay because they've been on planes a lot more than I have, and I'm going to look at them, and they're, they're smiling, they're passing out food and drinks, they're having a good time. I'm feeling better. And 99 times out of 100, that works. But we were on a flight in Nepal, and we, were, we took off, and we're going, and it was uh, probably the most, let me just tell you, I was definitely saved by the end of that flight, okay? Um, and so I'm on this flight. Uh, we're, we're making our way there. And uh, we are uh, about to start our descent. And it's a little shaky. And so I'm like, well, I'm just going to look, look for the flight attendant. And the flight attendant's seat was like right in the middle of the aisle. Couldn't, couldn't miss her. Okay. And so, and I'm sitting up front, um, which I normally don't like to do anyway. But I'm sitting up front. And so I just peer out into the aisle. And I look at the flight attendant. And to my dismay, she's white knuckling the seats. And she's pushed up like that. And I thought... Okay, that's not helping very much. And so here's Israel. They're at Mount Sinai. Their leader, their mediator is afraid. This is the experience of Mount Sinai. Now, fast forward 2,000 years. Jesus, the Word made flesh, God incarnate, is walking among us. It says we have seen his glory, full of grace and truth. And he's walking among us and a woman who had been bleeding for years and ceremonially unclean wouldn't be able to go into the temple, much less approach the holy mountain of God in Exodus 20. She reaches out and she grabs the garment of Christ. And rather than being annihilated on the spot, she's healed. Isn't that good news? Jesus goes to a town and the dirtiest, rottenest sinner that you ever saw, a guy by the name of Zacchaeus, is there. And when Jesus comes into his presence, he doesn't die on the spot. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to come eat at your house today. When Jesus is dying on the cross, he's got a criminal there next to him, dying on the cross. And he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And we sing this old hymn, the dying thief... Rejoice to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, the vilest he, wash all my sins away. Many years ago, I was leaving one church to go to another, and a guy who hadn't been involved in church at all, who became part of the church. In fact, I think now he is a deacon at the church. Um, he walked up to me, tears in his eyes, and he said, I want you to say something everywhere you go that you said at this church. I said, okay, what is that? He said, you don't take a bath to come to God, that God is the bath. And for him, that made a big difference in his life. We can approach Jesus knowing that we approach a high priest who empathizes with us in our weakness, who cares for us, and so we can boldly approach the throne of God, not because of anything that you've done, not because of anything in and of yourself, but because of what Christ did on the cross. Finally, number four, devote yourself wholly to God. Since this is a reality, since Jesus died for our sins, since he rose from the dead, since he is our great high priest, you should devote yourself wholly to God. How should we worship God? We should worship God with acceptable worship, it says. Now, you'll notice in the Old Testament, when we read uh, the guidelines, it even said that animals couldn't approach the holy mountain. And if they did, if an animal touched the mountain, then we should stone them to death. Now, it's just crazy when you're reading Scripture what comes to your mind. And the first thing that came to my mind is my dog Ozzy wouldn't make it. Because Ozzy would definitely touch the mountain. In fact, he might try to mark his territory on the mountain. We'd all uh, be in trouble. 
But in the Bible, there is such a thing as acceptable worship to God, and there is such a thing as unacceptable worship to God. One of the opening chapters in the Bible, you have a story, the story of Cain and Abel. And Abel brought an acceptable sacrifice to God, and Cain brought an unacceptable sacrifice to God. It's a major theme moving forward with Israel, that they had a bad habit of showing up to worship and worshiping God in joyous assemblies and following Sabbaths and festivals and going through the motions, but it was a complete disconnect from what they were doing in their daily lives. Not caring for the least of these, not serving the Lord in sincerity and truth on other days. In fact, turn over with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 15. Because in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus talks to a group of people who were not worshiping God acceptably. In Matthew 15, verse 1, it says, Some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, you've got to think, they're traveling from Jerusalem, so it meant that, you know, they, they keep having these encounters with Jesus. And they keep losing. <laughs> they keep coming up with ideas. They're playing chess. He's playing, or excuse me, they're playing checkers. He's playing chess, all that sort of stuff. And so they, they come before Jesus over and over again, and Jesus just simply continues to put them to shame. And so now you've got to imagine that they come up with something else. Okay, well, now we're going to, we got this question. So they travel out of Jerusalem to go to Jesus and ask him this question. And it says in Matthew chapter 15, verse 3, Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? Now, what they had repeated to Jesus wasn't actually the law. It was Jewish oral law. You see, you've got the Old Testament, and what they've done is they've taken the Old Testament and they've come up with their own ideas, and they've laid that on top, their own rules, they've laid that on top of the Old Testament. And as Jesus is about to point out, that's a real problem. Because it says in verse 4, For God said, Jesus said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who cur curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. In other words, he's like, you've got God's word and you've got your tradition and you're making God's word subservient to your tradition. We do that today, by the way. We come up with ideas. We come up with slogans. We come up with uh, theories today that sometimes we override what Scripture actually says to follow our traditions. So here's what Jesus says to them, chapter 15, verse 7. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. In other words, you've learned the right jargon. You've learned how to go through the motions and follow rituals and all of these Sabbaths and festivals and so forth. You're doing awesome at all those external factors, but your heart is far from me. And if there's a warning for us here today, it's that it's not enough for you simply to show up to church and put on a performance for everybody else around you. There, in reality, they were playing a role. You know, I've told you before, one of my favorite movies is Rocky, okay? There's a difference between Rocky and Sylvester Stallone, right? I would have a hard time if I saw Sylvester Stallone not seeing him as Rocky, but he's not actually Rocky, right? Those are two different people. And this idea of hypocrites is this idea of putting on a mask where you're playing a certain role, but that's not really who you are. And I think people, especially in the Bible Belt, have a tendency to do that where we put on a, a pretty face, we put on a nice front for everybody, but sometimes our heart is far from God. That is not acceptable worship. What does acceptable worship look like? He clarifies what acceptable worship looks like. He says, in, if we go back to Hebrews chapter 12, he says, with reverence and all. We are to worship God with reverence and all these are synonymous words. It's two words for the same concept. Reverence literally is the word for fear. It means to exercise caution. It means that when you start to worship God, you actually take that seriously rather than take for granted that you are bringing yourself before a holy and righteous God. And here's the thing. It's not just about 9.30 or 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. It's about how you live your life 
each and every day because all of your life that you live is before God. You are living your life before God, and one day you will stand in his direct revelatory presence, and all that's fake and phony will be burned away. That's true for me. That's true for all of us. He's giving them a warning to the church, to the church, that this is something they need to be prepared for. Why? Because our God is a consuming fire. So the point, as we wrap this up, is that we need to make real changes in our lives. We need to make real changes in our lives. I heard this week that every action you take, every action you take is a vote for the kind of person you want to become. I want you to think about that. Every action that you take is a vote for the kind of person you want to become. So as you go through your day, you're going to make choices, all kinds of choices. What you say, where you go to eat, how you speak to people, how uh, you spend your time, you're going to make all kinds of choices. And each one of those choices is a vote for the kind of person you're going to be. So how are you going to spend your life? Because the truth is, what does he say at the end, the conclusion of all this? Verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. So you can put on a mask here on earth, but one day when you stand before God, you will not be able to wear a mask because God sees us as we are. Now I'll say this, a lot of controversy this week, right? A lot of controversy about uh, the Olympics and all that. I'm not really going to get into that. Uh, those conversations should happen, and you should always pursue truth. But I will say this. As you think about all the controversy, do you know what the Bible says about judgment? The Bible says judgment begins at the house of the Lord. So we can look out at the world, and we can see the darkness in this world, and we can think in our minds, oh, God's going to get you. 1 Peter 4, verse 17, judgment begins at the house of the Lord. We're all going to be accountable for how we live our lives. And what you want to make sure that you're doing is that whatever front we put on on Sunday morning or in certain circumstances, that that's really who you are. There's a consistency between your heart and your actions, between what you perform and who you really are. And you devote yourself each and every day to serve Christ, to become like him, to be sincere of heart. That's what we're called to be because God is a consuming fire and we're going to stand before him one day, okay? And I hope that you're able, I hope that you're able to approach that throne with confidence because you know that you are standing on the rock of Christ. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. God is a consuming fire, the splendor of his holiness and righteousness will simply consume the fakeness, the pettiness, the injustice, the unfairness, the wickedness in us. And so make sure that when you stand before God, that you stand before him as someone in the shadow of the high priest, Jesus Christ, because you belong to him. Gracious Father, I pray today that as we reflect on your word we would know that we need to heed your warning this warning is not issued to the world it's issued to a, a church full of people who are claiming to be followers of Christ and so Lord help us to reflect on our own hearts make sure we're not putting on a show being fake but there's a consistency between Sunday morning and Tuesday at work between how we act at church and how we act at school in the marketplace as we're driving down the road wherever it is help us to be genuine Lord I thank you for this church I pray your Holy Spirit would convict us of any sin and righteousness and judgment we love you Lord it's in Jesus name we pray amen let's stand the altar's open if you want to come trust in Christ today, give him your allegiance. If you want to join the church or follow through a believer's baptism or 
if you want to just come kneel at the altar. You know, we're doing a deal right now where we're starting to get into a rotation. We're calling people in the church to pray for different things on different Sundays. Like the first Sunday of the month, we're praying for missions. The second Sunday, we're praying for a reach campaign. The third Sunday, we're uh, praying for something else that will come to me later. But the fourth Sunday, we're just praying for things in our church, things going on in the life of our church. And so as you think about it, on this fourth Sunday, I want you to begin praying. Whether you come kneel at the altar, grab someone, come pray at the altar, whatever it is, I want you to pray for this church today and pray for your role in it, whatever that is. But let's respond as the Spirit leads us right now. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood washed for me and that so much for being here today and worshiping with us and praise you go out that the Holy Spirit's given you a few things to reflect on and think about uh, but love you thankful to be your pastor and uh, to serve you in that way let's pray and then we'll be dismissed in prayer gracious father thank you for your love and your kindness pray Lord as we leave this place today your Holy Spirit would go with us we'd reflect on what your word says and how we're living faithfully or consistently with it. And Father, I pray that you would reveal any steps we need to take to be in good fellowship with you. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.